This video is part of the series to accompany discrete mathematics and functional programming. I'm Thomas Van Druden. This video is the first of a two video series in which we demonstrate a few fundamental concepts in ML programming. In any style of programming, the task of programming can be divided into structuring data and operating on data. That is, how is the information your program uses stored and organized? And how does the program manipulate that data? If you've programmed before in a language that supports classes, you'll notice how this dichotomy of data and functionality is reflected in a class having data members, or instance variables, and behavior members, or methods. You can see it also in the names of computer science courses such as data structures and algorithms. In our case, as we learn the first lessons of functional programming, we'll realize this dual task by learning to write our own operations and write our own types. That much will be covered in this video. The following video will pick up on that to provide our, our first look at self-reference or recursion. Getting you to think recursively is one of the main goals of the entire DMFP course. So this will lay down some important groundwork. These videos, this one and the next, will cover ideas presented in uh, sections 1.10 and 11 and also 12, and will also preview some concepts that you won't find in the book until chapter 6. For the full details, and to get this at a slower pace, see the relevant sections in the book. Previously, we've seen how to enter expressions into the ML interpreter and how variables work in ML. We've seen operations like arithmetic operations. The first thing we'd like to do is define our own operations. The way we do that is to write an ML function. If you've programmed before, you should note that a function is pretty much the same thing as what other programming languages might call a method or a procedure. If you haven't programmed before, then use what you know about functions for mathematics to follow what's going on. In fact, it's better to think of this in terms of mathematical functions. Let's say we want an operation that will add 3 to any value. That's not a very profound operation, but we'll start with the simple. In other words, we want a function like f of x equals x plus 3. The way we express that in ML is almost identical to mathematical notation, but we precede it with the word fun, f-u-n, for function, and we close it with a semicolon. As you can see here, this function f of x equals x plus 3. A function, or what we would call the body of a function, is an expression, except that it has inside of it a variable that isn't bound to any value. In this function f, the body of the function is the expression x plus 3. But x is a variable that's not bound to any value. If we try to use x in the interpreter here, we get this error, unbound variable or constructor. By wrapping that expression inside a function and indicating that the variable x is a parameter to this function, we are saying that this expression is going to result in different values based on the context in which it is used, that is, based on the value given for the parameter x. I've used the word parameter here without defining it. It's what you may remember calling an independent variable back in algebra, or it is sometimes called the argument of the function. In programming, we distinguish between the formal parameter, in this case x, which is the variable used to stand for the value passed to the function when it is called, and the actual parameter, the value itself that is passed. In the two examples I've used here, the actual parameters have been 12 and 5. A function can take multiple parameters, as in this example, a function that multiplies two given values x and y.
One characteristic feature of the ML programming language is the ability to give special cases for parameter values. As a simple but contrived example, suppose we want to make a function that does integer division but has a safe way of handling division by zero. In this example, we give two definitions of the function safe div. The first definition applies to the special case where the second parameter is zero. In that case, this function will return the maximum value of the int type. Think of it as the closest thing we have to positive infinity. Don't worry about how val of int dot max int gets us the maximum value of the int type. Just trust me for now that it does. The second definition of safe div applies in the general case, when the special case does not apply, that is, when y is equal to something other than zero. This feature of ML, or this way of writing functions in ML, is called pattern matching. The idea is that x, comma, zero is one pattern that this function's input can take. Any int value for x followed by a zero for y matches this pattern. Anything else will fit the second pattern. The pattern, together with the expression used to evaluate the function for that pattern, is called a rule. The vertical bar is used to separate rules. Notice the keyword fun is not repeated. It appears only once at the beginning of the definition of the function. You've already been warned about the many uses the vertical bar is going to have in this course. If you've never used the vertical bar key before, on most computers you can find it on the same key as the backslash, which is right above the enter key. Before we move on, notice what the ML interpreter reports as the type for each of these functions. Here you can see that the type of safe div is int by int. Notice that looks the same as a uh, int tuple. Then there's an arrow and int. The arrow indicates it is a function type. The int by int indicates that this function takes two parameters, each of type int. The int to the right of the arrow indicates that this function returns an int. We can use function names as if they were variables. Here's mol, and you can see that like safe div, it has a type int by int arrow int. It's a function from two ints to one int. And also f has type int to int or int arrow int. It's a function that takes an int and returns an int. Now, speaking of types, we've already learned about the types int, real, care, and string, and we've also seen tuple types. We also know to think of types as sets. In ML, we can define a type, at least a small, finite type, using a construct called a data type. For example, let's make a data type that represents a set of different kinds of bread. So here, the data type bread, as we've entered it, can be white, for white bread, multigrain, rye, or kaiser, indicating that the bread being used in this case is a kaiser roll. Notice that when we enter this into the ML interpreter, the interpreter gives us back essentially the same thing that we typed in, indicating that it now recognizes the type bread, although it does alphabetize the different values that this type can have for us. It's conventional to capitalize the values of the new type we define and keep the type's name itself lowercase. We can also use the data types of values as expressions. When I type in Kaiser, the interpreter returns with it, the most recent value, as being Kaiser, and the type of that expression or value is bread. Likewise, we can store these values in variables. Suppose we use the idea of a data type to define a wider range of food options. This will set up an extended example where we imagine using ML to represent and manipulate menu items at a restaurant. One way to read this is that the values listed indicate 
what values can be put in a context that expects a certain type. If we have a context that expects a deli meat, then ham, turkey, or roast beef are acceptable values. Now, types like these, with very limited values, are not very interesting. But the data type construct is more flexible than what I've shown you so far. At the bottom of the slide, we can see something else going on. We also can define data types whose values carry around extra information with them. Or to put it more formally, we can define data types whose values are made for more complicated patterns. Consider this last data type defining an entree in our restaurant. Let's say an entree is either a sandwich or a pasta dish. Any sandwich value in this definition carries around with it a tuple comprising a choice of bread, a spread for the sandwich, a vegetable, and a deli meat. Any pasta has a kind of noodle, a sauce, and some protein. The ML syntax here, especially the use of the word of, may be a little confusing. But the way to think of this is that sandwich, with a capital S, is a label that can be applied to the bread, spread, vegetable, and deli meat tuple to indicate that the value is to be considered an entree. Having put this now in the ML interpreter, we can do some examples of, with this. And we can see that lettuce is a vegetable, but more importantly, we can actually make an entree. We can say pasta of, let's say, spaghetti with a creamy sauce and with chicken as the protein and the ML interpreter sees that this is an entree. It is a value that fits the pattern indicated by the data type entree. That is, uh, it's something that has the label pasta and then has the extra information of a noodle, a sauce, and a protein together in a tuple. These data types complete the example. Consider the side data type. A side can be fries, chips, carrot sticks, garlic bread, or salad. If a salad, there is a further choice of either a Caesar salad or a garden salad. The salad of salad in the side data type looks especially weird. Just understand that lowercase salad is the type whose values are Caesar and garden. Capital salad is a pattern for the side data type, and values of that pattern also contain as a component a value of the type lowercase salad. The meal data type has only one pattern. Any meal value will have the label capital M meal and an entree side beverage tuple as extra information. Next, we'll look at how to define operations on the types we have made. Here is the first of two operations on types from the restaurant example. Let's suppose we want a way to calculate the calories of various things, starting with beverages. If you have a function for a simple straight data type like beverage, then you can, simply, give an explicit pattern for every value in the type, as we have here in this function calories. Now we have defined this function calories. We can apply calories to a value of the beverage type. Calories can be treated as the name of a variable and it has type function from beverage to int. And if we had a variable, let's say val d, which is equal to, let's say, lemonade, then we can apply the 
function calories to this variable b, and it will return the calories in lemonade. I'll say as a side note that while this works as a simple example for us right now, if you ever did want to associate pairs of values, as in the beverages and calories here, there are better ways of doing that than defining an explicit function. To see pattern matching in action with programmer-defined data types, consider this one that takes a meal and returns another meal with a healthier option. It has three patterns. The first matches specifically to a sandwich with fries as the side. The variables BRD, SP, VEG, DM, and BEV will match against any option for bread, spread, vegetable, deli meat, and beverage. We can use all that to construct a new meal with the same sandwich and beverage, but with carrot sticks instead. So you can see that the body of the first rule is a meal constructed using the variables given in the pattern, except that the explicit value fries is replaced with the explicit value carrot sticks. Likewise, this function will take any pasta meal that has garlic bread and give a garden salad as a side instead. The last rule has x as its variable, or really as its entire pattern. x will match against any meal, regardless of whether it has sandwich or pasta as its entree, and also regardless of whatever it has as a side, whatever it has as a beverage. Therefore, the variable x here stands for the entire meal, whereas earlier the variables like BRD, SP, VEG, DM, BEV, NUDE, SA, PRO, all of these variables were standing in for certain parts of the patterns represented. Again, this last rule has x as its pattern, and that variable x can match against any meal. In that case, we return it completely unchanged. So if you really want fries, you can always order it as a side with pasta, and this function won't take it away. So far, we haven't learned enough to do anything really interesting. To do anything non-trivial, we'll need to program operations that take several steps to compute the results. We'll do that by thinking of the problem in terms of reducing it to a smaller problem, and then having a way to, in turn, solve that problem repeating this reduction until we reduce it to a problem that is trivial. The key to that is the idea of recursion, which will be our topic in the next video.